Low fares, cheap flights, and monster profits. This is the business model of low-cost airlines that dot the aviation landscape, such as Ryanair and EasyJet. This attractive market segment has gained the attention of several flag carriers as well, such as Qantas, who have leapt into the market with their low-cost subsidiary Jetstar, expanding throughout Australia and Southeast Asia. You might be wondering then, why doesn't the USA's big three have their own low-cost carriers? But here's the thing, they actually did. United, Delta, and American all had their own low-cost carriers that operated in the United States, and they all went bust. This is their story. The early 90s of the United States was a turbulent time for airlines. The recession plus deregulation had opened up the floodgates for all sorts of new airlines to enter the market and seek their fortune. With falling prices and a market keeping pace, airlines needed to expand quickly into the new low cost segment. These airlines were Delta Express, United Shuttle, Continental Light and Metrojet by US Airways. Our first on the list, Delta Air Express, was marketed as a no-frills airline within an airline. We've secretly replaced this discount airline with Delta Express to Florida. Let's go aboard, shall we? Wow, reserved seats. Again, Jim! What if I told you this is really a Delta Express flight? Hey, we get Delta Sky Miles! I knew there was something different. It would operate a fleet of Boeing 737-200 aircraft out of Orlando and focus on the holiday travelers market with an all-coach cabin, with no in-flight entertainment or meal services. The airline was relatively successful from 1996 to 2003, but still had one problem. Delta did not manage to gain enough productivity out of the workers and planes, so its costs remained high compared to its rivals. Plus, the Spartan Delta Express was linked so closely with the mainline operations at Delta that it confused passengers and would lead to travelers choosing other airlines as they would not know what to expect when they flew on a Delta branded plane. It's fabulous. Delta Express. Delta Express was eventually shut down in 2003 and replaced by another Delta low-cost carrier called Song, an airline made for women, but we'll cover that in a future video. United wasn't going to be left standing still, and in 1994, they made a deal with the Pilot and Mechanics Union to start a new airline with the groups owning 55% of this new carrier. This new airline, codenamed the U-2, would replicate the success of regional competitor Southwest Airlines, a single fleet of all the same plane and no hot meals, frequent services, and a simple fare structure. You won't, really. Shuttle by United, astronomically low fares every day. But as it was still part of the mainline Delta Airlines fleet, it could access the computer reservation system and later on access the United Frequent Flyer program, although the airline did launch with unassigned seating at the time. This airline would have 58 Boeing 737s and operate out of Oakland Airport in the Bay Area as a point-to-point -point airline and would offer flights to destinations such as LAX, Burbank and Ontario for as little as 19 US dollars each way. With a new name to boot, Shuttle by United, branded on the side of each plane. What is this looming threat? It's called Shuttle by United. Fast forward three years later, and a change in management saw the airline turned into a hub-and-spoke model, feeding passengers to mainline United international flights from SFO and LAX. But if you're familiar with the airport, there is a bit of a problem with basing an airline at San Francisco's SFO. It gets foggy. 
It gets worse weather than Oakland and has a significantly higher cancelled flight rate. For United Shuttle, transferring the hub from Oakland to SFO was considered the single worst choice in the shuttle's history and saw its reputation and on-time performance plunge with its schedule falling into total disarray. By 1995, the airline's profit had flatlined and the carrier now became pretty much a subsidised airline operating off the back of the United mainline fleet. By 1999, the airline has operated solely as a feeder for international routes, and it long gone was the quick turnaround and cheap fares. Eventually, United no longer had any cost savings and folded it back into the mainline fleet. Just like with Delta, United would go on to have a second crack at the market with United TED, but that's a topic for another video. The next airline attempt on our list was Continental Light, which was a very short-lived subsidiary airline of Continental Airways back in 1993 that only lasted 18 months and lost over 300 million US dollars. It's true, only on Continental Light can you fly for peanuts without any restrictions. It's just one more way we're giving you more airline for your money. The carrier used a mix of aircraft from Continental, from DC-9s to Boeing 737-500 aircraft with all economy cabins. The airline was based out of Cleveland and North Carolina and at its peak had over 80 daily flights to 45 cities across the East USA. Alas, they couldn't seem to make any money and by 1995, the service was closed and turned back into a standard Continental aircraft fleet. One of the main reasons why this venture failed was not only did it not make any money, but its costs were so much higher using Continental facilities and failed to be any way better than its rival Southwest. Simply put, if given the choice, passengers would choose the bright and bubbly Southwest brand over this light alternative. The last airline of this low-cost period was Metrojet by US Airways, developed as a way to starve off new low-cost competition in the US Northeast, US Airways sought a way to replicate the success of the Delta Express to the south. The carrier would have a single class of service, operate a single type of aircraft, the Boeing 737-200, and fly a very limited network out of Baltimore. The airline would also be able to access the US Airways booking system and point program. This airline reportedly was actually quite nice, with 33 inches of legroom throughout, allowing two bags with every passenger, low fares, and excellent customer service. In fact, the success of Metrojet would actually be its downfall, because it seems that no one was paying attention to the main airline, US Airways. That's right, it seems that all the attention was on the wonder child and that US Airways itself started to struggle. Passengers were not only choosing to fly on Metrojet over rivals, but over their mainline carrier as well, cannibalizing high-paying Western Airways customers. Metrojet had the least fuel-efficient aircraft in the US Airways fleet and operated with incredibly high wages. US Airways didn't renegotiate like the other carriers with the unions, but just simply used mainline staff from the carrier. If Metrojet was to keep growing, then it would be at the cost of US Airways. And at less profit per passenger than the mainline fleet, it would be doomed for the firm. After the horrible tragedy that was the September 11th attacks and the subsequent fall in airline demand in that period, US Airways chose to close the operation swiftly and merge the Metrojet fleet back into the mainline carrier. Had the times been good, we could have predicted that US Airways spin off the Metrojet brand, but that's an alternative future that we will never see. These airlines would not be the last time that these carriers experimented with low-cost airlines within airlines, but it would be the only attempt at the magical optimistic 90s where these mainline carriers could do no wrong. Stay tuned for the next in the series where we'll look at these airlines of the 2000s that rose and fell in the blink of the eye and still tried to capture that mainline low-cost magic. 
And if you enjoyed today's video, then I highly suggest you check out the other Airline Grounded episodes, such as the one about Donald Trump's shuttle airline, and even the one that was run by the restaurant Hooters. And if you want to see more aviation topics, then consider subscribing to the channel today. And for those who want to explore this history more of the 90s low-cost carrier boom, then we have a fantastic website with more information at foundandexplained.com with a behind-the-scenes look at these airlines. And lastly, if you want to support the channel, then we have a great Patreon where you can see videos early, talk to other members, and choose what topics come next on Found and Explained. Thank you so much for watching.